If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back and I'm excited because we got the first Navy person here with us. I've been asking the Navy people and suddenly he arrives. He's uh, known as Angel 45 or Angel 45, I suppose is his call sign. Other people will know him as Rear Admiral Arne Suderland. And as I always say, I have a problem saying that name and I'm sure I'm not the only one. So you are most welcome with us. Thank you for being here. We are really appreciating your time. I hope this will be the first episode of many. You can talk as much as you want. But let us start. Where do you come from? Who's your parents? How did you end up in the Navy? First of all, thank you, Chris, for having me. Uh, mm -hmm. I come from Kimberley. Uh, my father was uh, the OC of the Kimberley Regiment. My mother was just an OG housewife, a very good one. And because of his military background, he was a fighter pilot during World War II, fought in Burma. Um, the military was sort of born in me. I got so used to it. And I had a, spent the first 17 years of my life in Kimberley, uh, which is a very historic town. It's the center of South Africa. And I walked the battlefields. So there was always into something interesting. I had a, a great life there. And I joined the Boy Scouts because in those days we didn't have computer nerds and things. And I liked the outdoors life. And I ended up in the Sea Scouts, which included visits to Simonstown, Durban, and various other visits. And so I decided I was going to join the Navy. Now, was it a huge step for you? I mean, coming from Kimberley, which is really in the middle of a country, there's no ocean there. Have you ever seen the ocean? And, and how do you get to the Navy? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sarcastic. I'm just curious. <laughs> I was going to say about car, but I won't be funny. The <laughs> Kimberley had a big fan called the Toit Span, and the boys, the Sea Scouts had a boats on the, the end. And also, as with most inland people, we always went to spend our holidays in East London. And later, my father bought a plot in Nysda, and we spent a lot of time in Nysda. But also, during my training as a sea scout, we did trips to the Navy, Simonstown. Durban wasn't a naval base, but we came pretty close to it at that stage. So I was brought up very much. I loved reading about the Royal Navy, uh, destroyers and things. And it, it just seemed the best the best choice I could make. So when you when you joined the Navy, this was first in the late 60s, wasn't it? Actually, in the middle 60s. <laughs> middle 60s. I stand to... Yes? <laughs> no, no problem. In 1965, I wrote to the Navy to apply uh, to go to the gymnasium, but I was turned down. In fact, I wasn't even balloted. I was one of the people who wanted to go and do my nine months training in those days. And since they turned me down, I then applied to go become an officer in the Navy as the permanent force. They sent me a train ticket. I came down here. And while waiting to see them, I walked into the recruiting office and joined as an AB. So, in fact, ended up as an able seaman, permanent force. Uh, but then after my basics, I got selected and became a, a midshipman. And that was the start of my career as such. We were speaking to an army fellow here for a long time, Brigadier General C.J. Bowman, Wim Boris, as we call him. He was the officer commanding of a special force brigade. And I believe he tried to explain to us why the Navy salute in such a strange way with a hand down instead of showing it. Can you tell us why? Why is that? Well, it, it was a good idea because the entire SANDF now follows suit. But the rumor goes that in the old days, sailors worked with tarred ropes. And therefore, when you saluted, you didn't show your dirty hand and you sort of politely held your hand up to your head. So it was a, a polite reason not to insult an officer. So when you joined the Navy in the middle 60s, did we add any vessels? Uh, I, I'm curious. I don't know. I, I remember the Navy with the frigates and things like that afterwards, but not, not well, at, at that, that time. Stage, we just received a third of our president class frigates. So we had three very modern frigates. Uh, we worked much, a lot with the Royal Navy as well. So it was a very interesting time. We had 10 minesweepers. We had two fleet minesweepers, one of which was the famous HMS Polaris, which led the D-Day landings. We called it Peter Maritzburg. Then we had the Somerset, which was a boom defense vessel. 
and we had two destroyers of which both had been converted, just been converted to carry helicopters. And they were very capable. In fact, one little story, if you don't mind me interrupting you, we had a US aircraft carrier that came around the coast and we were gonna meet her and our chief of the Navy is in the Rear Admiral uh, Beaumont, went out on the JVR, I think it was a JVR, which had two WASP helicopters on board. And they were gonna be picked up by the Americans who were gonna be flown to the aircraft carrier, but they decided that it was too risky. They couldn't fly in that weather. So he said, would you mind if I came by my chopper? And in this little destroyer bouncing around, he was landed on the flight deck of the American aircraft carrier to the embarrassment of the Americans who would not fly the helicopters in that weather. So we had at that stage, two destroyers, which could each carry uh, helicopters, three frigates. Oh, and then we had two World War II frigates, Good Hope and Transvaal as well. So it was substantial. Not all of it manned, though much of it was in reserve. May I ask you, why was the Navy powerful? What, what made it so special? I mean, even the Brits, the Royal Navy, used to use the harbors here quite a bit. I think until, what, 1975 or something, when the Simonstown Agreement came to an end. Perhaps you can just give us a background. Why South Africa and the Navy should actually be one? It's probably the more important of all the services. Just my opinion. Don't hate me. <laughs> I will not comment on that in case my friends get revenge on me. But South Africa has a, is a very, believe it or not, is actually a maritime nation. If you look at it carefully, most of our borders are with the sea. Uh, most of our trade comes across the sea. If you think manufactured goods all came in from that side. Our borders to the north were a lot uh, less developed countries. So all our exports, almost all our exports in heavy stuff went by sea. We were also on the, on the uh, Cape Sea route, which was a critical, if you go into your history of the World War II, there are certain choke points, Gibraltar, Suez Canal, and Cape Point. Now people say, how can the open ocean be a choke point? The further south you go, the more less likely you are to survive because of the weather conditions. So it was a turning point. And the Royal Navy recognized this. They stationed their ships here, which covered both the Indian Ocean and the base was started in Simonstown in 1814. And the South African Navy, when we eventually started the little Navy, the first naval service we had was in 1922. Back the 1st of April is our official birthday. We turn 100 in next year. We got three little ships and we ran them until the uh, lack of funding meant we sold them. And we only restarted again in World War II, but as, as an adjunct to the Royal Navy. So, when 1957, they took over, we took over Simonstown, it was handed to us for their use whenever they wanted it. But part of it was to get more ships, which included our new frigates and things. So we had this big brother, Royal Navy, which looked after our defense, but slowly handed it over to us. And we had to be, have our own ability to pick up mines. If you record during World War II, at least two German ships dropped mines here. So, and we also sent minesweepers to the Mediterranean. I think they realized how good we were during that period. Uh, our Navy has a few world records. I don't know if you're aware of it, but one of our frigates sank a German U-boat within four hours of going on its maiden voyage to work up, which is a, a rather unique record. So the Navy has always been part of it. Unfortunately, later years, the government never realized this and concentrated on the land effort. Uh, but luckily, we survived. So we're still here. Can you tell me of any famous South African naval officers, uh, even if they were like not in the South African Navy as such? I still consider them South Africans. I know the pedestal, that's why I'm hinting at, but they were always as well, I'm sure. Yeah, now look, uh, numerous South Africans served in the Royal Navy. Uh, for many years, the strength of the South Africa's naval side was the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. They had more people than our South African Naval Service. And so a lot of them served in the Royal Navy. Others came over to, back to our Navy, transferred to us. I must tell you that we, we had a higher rate of pay, which was a good incentive for many of them. 
But a lot of people also left South Africa to join the Royal Navy because we were part of the Commonwealth in those days. And I think you're referring to Admiral Sir Edward Seifert, who joined the Royal Navy in 1904, the age of he was 15 years old. And he did very well in the Royal Navy. He became a Captain D, Captain in charge of a destroyer flotilla, and eventually cruisers, and in fact, the famous Operation Pedestal, the resupply of Malta. He was in charge of that. Later in 1943, when the Vichy French island of Madagascar was invaded by our forces. He was in charge of the, North, the naval forces there. So he's a, quite, a, quite a great example of a South African leadership at sea. There are many more. Uh, some of the famous submarine, even submarine commanders in the war. One of the first RNVR OCs, a volunteer reserve to become captain of a submarine was South Africa. And there, at least 50 South Africans served in Royal Navy submarines. So we've definitely got it in our blood. I've heard a story. I've heard the story that the female member of the Navy, a REN or something they called a Sue, her name was Sue, she sank a submarine. Is that true? Okay. You're talking about Sue Labaskakni. She was what we call a swan. And she was one of the members of the controlled loop uh, detection system in Saldana Bay. And it's a series of electronic devices which picks up any large item moving across it. And linked to them were explosive mines. Now, these aren't round things. These are like a, a hose pipe filled with explosive. And they were laid across the routes. And she detected something coming in. She wasn't sure. She called the officer. And he said, if you think it is, blow. She did blow. There was a tremendous explosion. However, there was never, they never found any proof of it. And subsequently, unfortunately, for the U-boat record that's been made available now, uh, she, she might have been, I don't want the Greens to be watching this program, she might have killed a very big whale. But she was highly commended for it because she was awake, um, which is something too, because on duties like that, people tend to fall asleep very easily. She was awake and everyone is very thrilled with her performance. Yes, yes, there were all sorts of things also. There were a dance or something going on in the background, which she didn't attend. Uh, people <laughs> did uh, point at a few fingers, but uh, that's how it is. I've heard someone else, uh, I spoke to an Israeli officer once, and, and he said to me, it's quite easy to create an army. If you have willing young men and they're willing to run around and they carry a rifle, you can do something with them rather easily. But the Navy, the Navy is, is technical. Uh, is it possible just to take anybody, put him on a ship and think he's, he's going to be able to, to run that ship as a warship? <laughs> you, you have to throw in a joke, don't you? No. To get command of a ship is one of the uh, submarines, even worse, by the way, but to get command of a ship is a long, long slog. And it's, you start right at the bottom and you have to qualify one has to bear a few things in mind what makes a ship different to any other weapon of war. A ship is a, a living part of South Africa which moves around the international waters. And as you go, you are part of South Africa. Um, they call them the great diplomats, ships. And you've got to you take the responsibility of the state with you. It's the rules of the road at sea. There's a lot of technical issues. And by the way, when you have a fire, there's no fire brigade to phone. When you have run out of fuel, have an engine breakdown, there's no AA or whatever company it's called. So you have to have a mix of highly qualified people at all times. So the Navy makes it very, very complicated. If you bear in mind that we've just had two of our ex aircraft have been away on an operation off of northern Mozambique, they were away from home for three months. And... We had to supply them with, they had to look after them and prepare them, et cetera, out of a, a foreign port. So it takes a lot of effort. They've got to be part of it. So yes, it takes a long, long time to command. And it's a very, very strong selection process as well, especially for a submarine, which adds the three dimensions, which makes it slightly different. So it seems to me there's more expected from a naval officer. He's not just a commander. He has to carry the flag, as you said. He has to be a bit of a diplomat. 
Oh, yes. Is, in fact, I've always said that my career was one of the most fascinating careers in my life. I never had the same job for longer than about three years. And you learn to be everything. You, I ran personnel in intelligence, you ran projects, you stood by the building of ships, you sailed, you did operations, and you became a diplomat as well. And in fact, I was lucky one of those who became a diplomat. And I spent three years as an attache, nature and advisor in London. So you, they're very multi-qualified. Multi you have to be. I wonder, would it be possible for you just to give us a brief background of your own career so that people can understand you actually do know what you're talking about? <laughs> because some might not know your name. I do know your name, but um, some might not. I, I joined the Navy and I spent a year and a half at the Military Academy on a, on a, on a, for the reason to get a degree. In my, when I joined, you had to be, have a degree to become an officer. And halfway through my second year, which I would like to mention I was passing, I was proming, I discovered an intake all of a sudden had come in because they'd realized that they needed officers faster. And when I went back, I went and asked to be withdrawn and to become a direct entry, which caused a lot of turmoil. Marcus Milan uh, was then a brigadier and my boss, but he was eventually convinced. And I withdrew and I came back to the Navy. I'd done all my courses, so I was fairly advanced, and I went back to frigates. And while serving on frigates in 1969, Pretorius, I was called in and told in three weeks' time I'm being sent across to Argentina to join a sail training ship called the Libertad to do a circumnavigation of the Atlantic. So that was my first big break. Um, they say join the Navy, see the world. And uh, that's my first start. And so I flew across and I spent about eight months, lovely months, touring the uh, Western seaboard of the Atlantic, across to Europe, Africa, and down again. So that was a very, very useful experience. I learned to speak Spanish, and I learned about working with other navies as well. I came back, and I came back to frigates. Where I spent some time in frigates and got commissioned. In fact, just after my commissioning as a youth boy, one pippa, I had a little thin stripe. I got sent to a minesweeper as the second in command, which was quite a unique thing because luckily I'd qualified for bridge watch keeping. And I spent two years on minesweepers before going back to frigates. I went across to escort back the third submarine. I then applied for submarine service, but I burst an eardrum. I went back for my retest and I burst my other eardrum. Sorry if I'm boring you at the moment. I decided that maybe I wasn't meant for submarines. So I hung on and I then got my first command, a torpedo recovery and diving support vessel. And then out of the blue one day, I was told I'd, I'd made it number one of number two. And I never knew what he meant. Until all of a sudden, one day I got my marching orders and I got sent across in a great secrecy. And a number of people had preceded me to Israel. And I spent nearly three years on a project, which was the acquisition of strike bomb. I was lucky enough to do about six months, I think it was, with the Israeli Navy in Sharm el Sheikh, which was a wonderful experience. You learn completely differently. We were trained in the English way, which is frightfully proper. And the Israelis do it differently, but very effective. And I think that was a major turning point in most of our lives. I then came back with the second strike craft. And at that stage, uh, we moved, we just we moved straight to Durban. We opened a new base in Durban. And I spent a few years on Strycraft, also a Shores personnel officer, and had another command there. I commissioned boat number six. And I then went on staff course, basically, Victoria to Special Forces as the Navy Ops for a very short while before I went to intelligence. Then got sent across to London. Came back to South Africa in 1997 where I helped run the fleet review with Nelson Mandela as the inspecting officer, and then got a wonderful position of chief uh, commander task group of the Navy and got promoted. So when we opened the new system down here, fleet command, I came down and ran the ships and units. And that's in a nutshell. 
except when I finished, I stayed in the reserve and I went into a new field called editing, book writing. And I became the editor of Navy News. And I do a lot of proofreading and writing for books and running a museum. But tell me, when you step on a ship the first time, is there any fear that you might, you know, become so seasick that you can't carry on with this, with this career in front of you? Or is that the last thing which you worry about? I, I can't remember being frightened of that. I, I think it's confidence. But I must tell you, when I was a personal officer in strike block, I on two occasions had to tell two OCs that their time was up. I won't mention their names. And that they've got to come ashore now. And both of them complained bitterly. I said, but every time you go to sea, you see sick. I said, yes, only for the first day or two. Um, so a lot of us, well, I, I personally don't have much experience. I was, I'm a lucky, lucky person, maybe. Uh, in fact, it's worse. I can't get sick. I just feel very uncomfortable. But I, I think you get used to it eventually. There are very few that are too seasick to go to sea. And if they're clever, they do it into branch transfer. They go somewhere else. These strike craft are known to be a bit of a wild horse or something on the sea. It, 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 it's a fair amount of jumping around. I've seen pictures of them, which looks like the sea is trying to eat them. Um, yeah. How was it on board? They, they love you to serve in there. Just a, a wonderful, wonderful vessels. But they were frightfully uncomfortable. Um, it, what is one of the funniest things, uh, not funniest things, that's the wrong way of putting it. In one of our, for one trip, we in fact had people injured because the, the floorboards in the forehead mess had jumped up and they fell into the bulges. And in fact, we had to eventually say people could not sleep for it because of the slamming. It's interesting that when you, if the ship is being driven into a wave, it meets a force of the sea coming up and it's an automatic, she hits it and back. And the whip, whiplash is dangerous. So we have to be very, very careful. On more than once, I've had a turn around and seek shelter. Uh, and at one time, my ship got quite badly damaged, which required cementing in holes, etc. All because of the, the seas. But we've never actually lost a ship to the waves. I mean, we did lose the ship in an accident, which is a very tragic story. Oh, no. no, not two waves. Um, I can just tell you a little story, which known. When we left Haifa on our run back, because of the secrecy of the operation, we were escorted by two Israeli ships and we were disguised as an Israeli ship. We had all their markings and everything. And the weather became so rough that we eventually had to seek shelter going up between Sicily and Italy. And when we came out, there was still bad weather. And in fact, one of the Israeli strike craft had its wave break forehead, which stops them water going over the gun, was peeled back and she flooded. And she had to turn around and head for home. So a number of ships have been damaged, but not sunk. Looking back, do you think the strike craft were the best choice if it wasn't for sanctions? Let's say you could have had anything else. Uh, I know it's, it's speculative, but... It's not speculative. It turns out that they were the only choice we could have had. If you go into our history, the special forces, only the strikecraft could have achieved what they did. Uh, you are aware that strikecraft took part in numerous top secret operations. And one of the most interesting things is the Russians who were advising the Angolans did not realize until about 2005 that our strike craft were taking part in operations. They suspected a Japanese fishing boat, which was reported on four operations as being seen, and thought we were sending wreckies ashore from fishing boats with a Japanese flag on. The reason behind it is that their equivalent was the Oza, which they had given to Angola. And their radius of operation was seldom more than 400 miles from a port. And the fact that we sailed our ships from Durban to Longobarn and then all the way up to Kabinda and places like that was just unknown. I can mention that what we did then could never be repeated. Nowadays, with satellites and things like that, you can never get away with it. The world has changed. Technology has changed. But at that time, 
they were the best ships for the job. And I also have one thing I want to mention, which I'm always dreadfully proud of, is we had 76 millimeter guns and a lot of navies use that gun, but they seldom use them in the anti-aircraft role. And we tested our guns and our, we had an analytical system here. Before we went into an operation, each strike raft had to achieve a 60% TTB. A TTB means a target triggered burst. So you have a target, which could be a, a drone thing. And when you acquire it, you fire your shells and at least six out of every 10 have to puff around it. They practice shot, which means we had utter confidence in our guns. And on one operation, when we knew there were MiGs in the air, some of us realized we were quite safe because they're not going to fly a MiG, single engine MiG over the sea too far. All the youngsters, young officers were so keen when they're coming, when they're coming, which wasn't the feeling the rest of them had. But that was the confidence we had in our ships. They were, that those, those ships were magnificent. This is the same 76 millimeter. I think it was the Ota Rieda. Do I say that correctly? OTO. I don't know how the Navy people say it. But that gun actually went over to the Roycott, the armored fighting vehicle. They were used for some of those guns and they put the them same, into a, a set. Yes. Same barrel, same barrel and mechanism. Yeah. 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 And I've heard rumors here that they now want to upgrade the remaining strike craft with a 155, with a G5. Do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? Physically impossible. There are only, there are only three hulls, four hulls left, one of which is an original Israeli one, and they could never take those things, and they are shot. I'll be blunt. They, they're still operating. We've got two of them operating. Uh, last week, I went to visit one of our new pyro vessels, which are magnificent ships. They're called inshore patrol vessels, but they're actually bigger than the strike raft, and they're going to serve, our, serve us well. But the strike raft, we had to strengthen the hulls for our waters. So they could never take a G5. There was talk about the frigates being upgunned, and that was in the 1980s. But that was also a pipe dream in a way. Because to marinize any gun, it's not easy. You could, you could use a marinized gun ashore. It means that nothing's ever going to affect it. But to take a normal gun and put it in a vessel, it'll seize up within within a week or two because of the salt water and the atmosphere. I've met a few sailors in my life. They were not at your rank. They were not commanding officers. And they said to me, they cleaned and they painted and they chipped away at, at rust. It, it, it seems to me that that was a large part of their job. Is, is that true or were we just talking? Oh, yes. I used to chip and paint as well. We all do. Maintenance of your the Navy works in an atmosphere that is very, very tough to survive in. Uh, everything rusts, uh, water leaks in, and when you've got electronics, etc. So a lot of effort is spent on maintenance. And also the Navy is very proud of its ships. Appearance is critical. Uh, when you were on duty in Simonstown in the old days, the senior officer used to come and inspect the ships every Sunday. He'd do his rounds. And woe betide you if there was cigarette butt or anything lying around. So the Navy's always been very careful because it's hygiene as well. You've got to also bear in mind that on a strike raft, for example, you've got 50 people, 48 to 50 people in a very enclosed space. So you've got to have hygiene, otherwise disease, etc., spreads fast. In fact, at times we had up to 75 on board for about three weeks. Yeah, that's probably when you were escorting the Special Forces people out. Oh, yes. <laughs> Would you know where we're going as commander? Okay. The security was very, very strong. Only one person on the ship knew where, what, how, and when. Two others would know where. Uh, the rest, in fact, we even, I'll never forget in one of our operations in which we made under overlays for a plotting without any names on it. And one of the chaps said, ah, I know where that is. And he, he named a similar port, but we just didn't say a thing about it. But it didn't take long before, and I'll be back. One of the Rickies would have said something, and the next thing, a lot more was known. But 
I'm very proud to say that we've never had a breach of security. Never. The guys were impressed. I think what I used to tell them was if anyone ever discovers you've spoken, I've got to get the certain director to come and speak to you. And that was enough to keep them quiet. Some commanders believe in briefing their men thoroughly and other beliefs in not saying a word. Uh, what would be the standard procedure? Would the ship leave a harbor and it's now beyond, beyond the horizon? And they would be, okay, we're going to do this or this, or would you just... We, we always... Okay, basically, we always worked up before an operation. So the people started realizing. We'd only confirm it before we left, before we sailed. We'd call them all in. we give them a description. we tell them the threat. we tell them what we want of them. So they were briefed. It's very important to brief them. And they had to know. And you always do that just before you left. Uh, because once you sail, you, there's nothing much more you can do. But you've got to brief the people. They're involved. They're part of a team. Uh, there were a number of operations in which chaps did not actually ever hear because the, even the special forces did not tell them. But that all came out eventually. Unfortunately, I'm the first to put it out. That's okay. With those time. I recall once, I think it was Mosul Bay or someplace. I'm not sure. I can't really remember. But I woke up in the morning and I saw we were a few strike craft lying. And the next day they were just gone. And that's when I realized the power of the Navy, that these people mm -hmm. can actually appear, do a job, get out, and you don't know when they'll be back, except they will be back. So from that viewpoint, it's, it's really something, it is something to be proud of. So this new Navy, which we got, it is sad for me that many people only remember the, the bribes and the things, unfortunately, which came with it. But still, yeah. the ships are there, the submarines are there. And as I asked you in the beginning, it's not possible to just grab a guy from the street and make him a commanding officer. It's not possible. Uh, so there's no such thing as, you know, doing affirmative action on a commander into a Navy ship. I mean, it, it can't be done. It's not possible. These, these people are professional sailors. So it's a very, very professional organization. Would you agree with me? I'm glad you raised that point. When we... When we started, the Navy was one of the first, in fact, uh, Admiral Simpson Anderson has written a magnificent book recently in which he speaks about how the Navy was basically left out a lot in the original discussions before the, the what do you call it, transformation started. And we went out and spoke to people and we said, we'll train your people. And one of the most successful courses of when the integrates came in was a course at Soldana which everyone was most impressed by. And from them, we started training officers. And we brought them up slowly. None of them were rushed. They qualified. And until you qualified in the Navy, you would not get a job. So you could not go to a ship as captain unless you qualified. And it's, it's quite fascinating how it fitted. In the submarines, is a perfect example where we've had a number of both races coming in and you cannot tell the difference. They are professional Navy officers. Uh, that was, that's what makes it so important. And I've be, always been very proud of the Navy that I remembered, the way they absorb people in. And I'm very proud of the Navy now, which is keeping up the standards. Unfortunately, of course, you can only keep up standards with the money you've got. And that's one of the sad things that I'm quite happy to say it. Government, more interested in social matters than in potential defense. And unless you maintain stuff, if you get a brand new car and you never take it to the mechanic, it's going to break down. So we have a problem there. But the try, the Admiral in charge down here tries so hard. I just want to add something. I went to go and see these new ships being built. Uh, there was a captain and a commander uh, in charge of the project and the commander of the first ship. De Bojo was the captain. And there were 18 of us, all old retired officers. And at the end, we all said, wow, this Navy is in safe hands. Because he briefed us on everything. He explained it. Everything, everything he said made sense. Uh, I'm very proud of him.
I have to say I'm proud of the Navy myself for many reasons. I know we have a, a, a black submarine commander as well. And by all accounts, which I've heard of a man, is fantastic. Nothing wrong with him. Now, how do you feel? And this is an unfair question, but I'll ask you because you have you have daughters. How do you feel about female sailors in the Navy? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say very controversial to get you, my revenge on you. I do not believe in gender equality because men cannot conceive. Therefore, men will never be equal to women. Basically, I watched women come into the Navy and I saw them. They had a lot of fighting to do to be accepted, but I don't know very many of them who did not produce. I know a lot more men who didn't produce. So I've learned that lesson. Women in the Navy, not a problem at all. The problem are men who don't trust them or don't think they should be there. Do you have any uh, disciplinary problems on ships? Is such a thing possible? On? On ships, on Navy ships, oh, yeah. because I know the, the US Navy have a huge problem with um, sexual misconduct, sadly so, even their submarines. They, they're known as the one service where a woman is not safe. Yeah. We've had women in our Navy in submarines for a long time now. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't remember a single incident. I don't know of any cases. I'm pretty sure that there are what we used to call courting in our days, but I don't know of any cases in which anyone has been accused or any things like that. Maybe we're different. Maybe we just think more accepting that. I suppose it's, it's right to say that you people all know each other, actually, because there are so relatively few ships. It's a small Navy. Uh, you should be able to know all the commanders and those following them, the second in command. I think, yes, we used to know most of the officers. Um, as, as you get more senior, so you start to learn more people. But don't forget, we've got bases in Wingfield, Gordons Bay, uh, Port Elizabeth, Durban, and Pretoria. So some people in different musterings you don't come across quite often. But most of us knew each other. I mean, when I joined the Navy, there were less than 200 officers in the Navy. I don't even know how many there are now, but it's a lot more than that. But that's because you've now got new musterings, such as computer wizards, and everything's been changed. A lot of stuff has been, requires new technology. So things are different. I think I might ask you now a silly question, but please forgive me if I do. But is it possible for a commander of a frigate or a strike craft just to start that thing up and to leave a harbor? I know he has to ask permission and those things, but I mean, how, how does it work for a ship, a Navy ship, to go somewhere? What happens? No. The, before you go to sea, you need a lot of people on board to, to prepare it, to warm through engines, to check. It's, it requires a crew. A ship can an emergency sail with a limited number for rescue purposes, I've done that a few times. That's a completely different thing. But it takes a lot of effort, a lot of people to take the ships. A frigate, particularly. Smaller ships, less people. I know we once sailed a strike craft with about 20 people on board, which was for an emergency. Uh, we only went out and came back. We were lucky we were capable of doing it. But the problem with that is, of course, you have more than one ship. It's not to say all 20 people are working at the same time. So how does these shifts work? Is it like 12 hours, six hours? Oh, well, what do you do? Okay. Basically, a ship's company works as a ship's company. Unless it's secure, in which case you've got a duty watch, which is just a number of people to keep it safe from fire. Sorry, I've got a high fever. But ships are at a certain notice for sea. For example, it could be 24-hour notice, which means you're relaxed. And it can go down to two hours notice. In fact, when you have a missing submarine, we have a submiss, you come down to an hour's notice, uh, two hours less than that. And that's a time in which you, the ship can be called away. So if there's an emergency, you always have a standby ship and you'll be at the lowest level. You can get away faster than that if you have to, but that normally allows you to recall people from their homes and things like that. I wonder if we can get a bit technical here. It is a fairly unknown 
service. In a sense, that most, most of us were called up to the army or like myself in it in the police. So we don't really know the rank structure. Can you tell us from Abel Seaman up to Admiral, how, what, what, what do you call these people? Okay. When you join, you join as a, my days it was a Seaman or AB2, which is the lowest rank. That's a, a troop. You then have uh, AB1, which today we call Abel Seaman. And oh, by the way, it's now back to Seaman. Abel Seaman is like a Lance Corporal. Leading Seaman is a Corporal. Petty officer, sergeant, chief petty officer, staff sergeant, uh, warrant officer, your sergeant major, and your warrant officer levels. And then you've got a few levels of that, the new, new ideas of command, warrant officer, et cetera, which I won't go into. You're in the officer corps, you start off as a midshipman, but we also have candidate officers as the Army and Air Force had. But as soon as you become a midshipman, you now live in the wardrobe, which the candidate officers didn't do. But the first rank is ensign, which is like a second lieutenant. Uh, then we've got a sub-lieutenant, which is a lieutenant. Then we've got a full lieutenant, who is an army captain or Air Force captain. Then lieutenant commander major, commander, lieutenant colonel, and captain, colonel, brigadier, general, rear admiral, junior grade. Then you've got major general, rear admiral, vice admiral, lieutenant general, general admiral. Well, Very that, that, that seems logical too. And you're following the Royal Navy type of rank. It looks like we, it. No, we, we used to, but in 1997, because we needed to bring in integrates into the higher ranks, they decided to go back to the old system of Brigadier General, which other countries have had for years, Americans have had for years. But in that is 1920, and the British Army took away brigadier generals and made them brigadiers. Very clever system. You just took away the back of their name and everyone was happy. We now went back to have the word general. And the Navy had a Commodore. And we decided that we would now make that into a re -admiral. And we used the American system, which is lower half and upper half. We said junior grade, senior grade. Uh, the, the British, the Royal Navy, has now made Commodore as a rank. So... It was always a post in the old days. Now it's a rank, so we've got similar structures. Rear Admiral Junior Grade, Commodore, and we're back to the Royal Navy system. I've heard a story that the captain, the commanding officer, cannot be, cannot go to the wardroom without invitation. Is that true? Yeah, many of the bigger ships, but uh, the strike craft is said to be relaxed it because. That stems from the fact that the captain has his own cabin on bigger ships and he has his own steward. Another good reason to join the Navy is you have waiters to serve you and if you're a captain, you have your own one. And so he has his own facilities. However, on smaller ships such as minesweepers, where even though that was a rule, he had to eat in the wardroom so you could not stop him. So I do remember a case in which a first lieutenant being nasty told his captain he wasn't welcome there, the poor captain had eaten his cabin. I'm surprised the guy didn't get thumped. But it's, it's traditional, captains invited into the world. Old tradition. Now does the South African Navy have a dry ships like the US one? Okay. That's an interesting concept. Uh, strike craft and submarines did not carry alcohol at all. Uh, but then we followed the American system at times too, which I don't know if you realize that, but on an aircraft carrier, they have lots of booze there, but it's only there for special occasions, et cetera. Uh, they aren't spicing the main brace is something which has been done by the Americans as well, but it's against the rules normally, only specific occasions. The bigger ships used to have bars, et cetera. Our frigates used to have bars, uh, which served, but I, when I was in charge of the ships, I basically advised them that the bars don't open at sea. Why? Because most of the people on board have a job to do in a watch system. We work four hours on, four, eight hours or four hours on. So you didn't want to have that risk. But more importantly, if a fire occurred, and even if you were just the stores officer, supply officer on board, you had to be capable of fighting the fire and things like that. So I 
brought in the thing during my time in charge of the fleet. Alcohol not to be consumed at sea. So there's a lot of training on such a ship. It's, it's never just sailing somewhere. <laughs> you always, every opportunity is, is instructional training. Uh, we also have simulators, so we use a lot of simulation effect. But at sea, the whole idea is to train people. I mean, if a ship is steering, doing nothing, you can always have a man overboard and you train your young officers. I mean, it's, that's the way you do it. You, you convince the young officers that they can handle the ship as well. So it's, it's quite important. I know there's a joke. One captain, they throw a big dummy overboard. The one captain was instructing his youngster and the youngster came up, made a mistake and went straight over him. So the captain looked at him and said, I'll tell you what, Lieutenant, when I fall overboard, just stop the ship, I'll swim to you. So basically it's a case of practice makes perfect, but the more you practice, the more confidence they get. Driving a ship is not like driving a bus. A bus has brakes, a bus has wheels, rubber on the road. A ship, when you stop a ship, the wind takes it. And you don't stop a ship. The only way to stop a ship is going into reverse. So that is another thing which a lot of army people never understood. Driving a Roy cut or one of those things, and I've driven them too, is simple. It's like driving a car. Driving a ship is completely different. It doesn't stop. It keeps running. Wind will take it. Can a naval ship be searched? Is it possible that if you go into a harbor that they insist they're going to search you? No. Only customs in South Africa can do a customs inspection, etc. But you've got state authority on a border ship and a warship may not be searched by anybody. So it's, it's your state authority. So there's nothing much you can do about it. Have you ever wondered when you sailed out on a mission that you might not come back, that that ship might be sunk by the enemy? No. We're always overconfident. Well, that's good to hear, actually. I mean, that is, it's, it's better than we're not, uh, not having confidence. Well, I, I believe we, and every time we went out, we felt we were prepared. Uh, not only did we feel prepared, but I think the authorities who sent us made sure we were prepared. Uh, one does accept the risk. Uh, I was around to lose people in operations, uh, not my people, unfortunately fortunately in a way even on a training exercise we lost people uh but an exercise i was on it happens you can have it everywhere but as for losing a ship we have confidence in ourselves if you look at history the repercussions of a ship sinking at sea through negligence are massive there's no ways we can afford to risk that no no, and it is a flag symbol, isn't it? I mean, that's why Hitler changed the, the name of a ship from Deutschland to, what was it, Lutzow or something, yeah. because he was scared that it, it would be sold. Deutschland, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, so, that's it. The, we, I, we often used to tell people, when a ship, one of our ships goes into Mombasa, one of those harbors, they have cocktail parties and they have big gifts. It's, it's a great thing. But if you sent... Um, 15 Willy Fun tanks down the main road of Mombasa, that has a different effect on people. So the Navy's a pride of the state. It's a, they show the state, they show the flag. We, every ship in commission has a flag. It shows the ensign at the, alongside the jack, whereas tanks, etc., don't, unless on parade, they put the pennant up. Not being nasty. I, I love the Army. In fact, I want to accentuate the Navy was my job. And one of my proudest things was when I went to London, I didn't go as the naval advisor. I went as the Navy and Army advisor. Was there any, any traditional hatred between the groups, Navy, Air Force, and um, Army? Not that I know of. At the academy, we all served together. I, on staff courses, we worked together as staff. I was also at SDS at the Defence College. We all worked at very different levels, and to the best of my knowledge, we got on correct. I've I've got so many friends in other services, uh, army, air force, medics, uh, and they treat you very well. I 
just give you an example. When I came back from overseas in 1997, before I got my next posting, I was sent as the naval part of the design, the new defense force, the joint forces thing. And I had a, a major general, Ulsik, uh, a brigadier general, Lord, brigadier Fenter. They were all brigadiers or major generals, and I was a captain. And from the moment we started talking, my word, we, we all knew each other. My word was accepted. I was treated exactly equal. And in fact, just towards the end, I got promoted, and it made no difference. We were treated well. So my experience is fantastic. I know that the Navy often shows the flag in the East, probably more than in the West. And yet the Navy is very close to the Royal Navy in tradition. So my question to you is, is the Navy now, has it evolved into its own, like a grown up, or is it still sort of tied to its parent unit, the Royal Navy? No, we, we were never tied to our parent unit, but we are still Western orientated. And uh, we, the East is where we need, it needs us once in a while. But if you look at our history, there's a, a book coming out shortly. In fact, it's already out in Afrikaans version by Professor Andre Vessels, in which it's, it goes on the skipper for the SR Fleur. And it details, it's one, quite a unique book, it details every diplomatic visit. I mean, ones I hadn't even heard of myself. And you'll see, even in modern times, ships were going, working with South America. We've had two ships going to Canada. We've had ships going to New York. We've had ships going to Europe. When I was in London, Drakensberg came there. We would be a bit of the Commonwealth. Drakensberg was present. So it is, we, we, I think we equal opportunity, friends. You invite us, we'll go, if we can afford it. And how were they uh, treated with ship's crew when they arrived at the harbor like that? Fantastic. One of the other very proud things we've got is we've never, ever had problems with our sailors in foreign ports. They are the best behaved sailors you can come across. So it's, 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 it's something which we've become known for. Uh, our visits have always brought back high praise so that I can attest to improve. I was about to ask about this thing about a sailor and a girl in every port. I know you're a happily married man for, what, 51 years now? I'm not going to answer now. <laughs> Just joking. No, happily married. Look, in every port, you meet people. It's parties, of odd cocktail party, etc. But that's more aimed at the merchant navy. I think it's something which you get in the merchant navy. They regularly used to go to ports of the world and their tramp steamers, etc. The Navy is too busy to mess around. And also, there are too many people to see you and report to your wife. Well, that's exactly. a thing, especially if it's a small Navy. Um, is it possible for a commander to refuse to take his ship out of the harbor, even if he's ordered to do so? Interesting question. The If he's got a a reason for it, unseaworthiness, etc. then he can, but he, he has to give over command. But disobeying a lawful command, it's worded like that. If it's a lawful command, go to sea to go and rescue that. No, I don't like those people. I'm not going to pick up a Babagindi Bob, citizen, etc. That's wrong. You can't get away with that. I've never come across it. So, the law overseas demands that you have to actually rescue people, uh, isn't it like that? If you see a robot dinky or something, you have to investigate. Oh, yes. There are cases in which merchant ships, except, for example, throw, throw people overboard, stowaways. Uh, that's a result of all the, the fact that if you don't get him over, sorry, if you have him on board, until you can get him landed, he belongs to you. And it becomes a yoke around the neck. So it's sad. It's like the current invasion of England by all these refugees. If they've got no other way of getting there and they're desperate, they're going to go. So... So you can't actually it, blame it, sir. I mean, it seems to me the newspapers are wrong here. They seem to be angry with the Royal Navy vessels or the vessels picking up these people, but they have no choice. That's what the law of the sea actually demands. 
and I can tell you now, the French and Royal Navy will always do so as well. They're definitely going to work. The South Africa actually had one stowaway incident as well. There's a, I'll just mention this, I can't stay too long, but the Otanukwa was on her way from Durban to Simonstown, where they got uh, deployed to Marion Island. And she turned south into the thing. And one of the chaps doing rounds found two stowaways in a vehicle they were carrying. And boy, if you've ever stowed away to the wrong country, it's going to Marion Island. But they were fed, they were looked after, they were from Tanzania. They were given, they worked in the galley and got food. They were treated like royalty. And in fact, it was quite an emotional handover where they handed over to the immigration in South Africa. And they went with new clothes and new all sorts of things. It's, you know, they're young boys and the Navy, the, the sailors looked after them. And so our only experience of a stowaway was a pleasant one. What happened to them afterwards, I'm quite sure they were looked after for a while. I think in the next episodes, I'm definitely going to ask you about the unrestricted warfare. Because that's something which came out, of course, at the Nuremberg trials. And I'm a former lawyer myself, and I studied those trials. Um, it's a hard question, isn't it? But we'll get to it. I mean, because it's not it's not as simple as the lawyers wants to make it out. It's actually damn hard for the guy who's in command right, right there at the scene. I don't think we'll see many examples of that again in the future. <clears throat> I think the world has changed. The world has become too controlled to allow that anymore. You might have it countries, the renegade countries, uh, North Korea, for example, is that the unknown. But I think even countries like Iran, et cetera, are going to be fairly careful. They are a bit fanatic, but I think that's something of the past. It, it, it's too, criminal, international criminal courts are now a big threat to the average person. Yes, and as you say, it's not the same game anymore. There are things now like electronics. You will be picked up. You, you can't escape. And it always comes out. I mean, we've seen the videos online of, you know, these poor people being thrown aboard, overboard, things like that. Yeah. But as a naval officer, are you trained in the rules of war? Yes. There's various, there's the rules of war, and then there was our rules of conduct, which is another thing. And um, every operation, we were given the rules of conduct. Rules of war tell how to defeat an enemy. The rules of conduct say what you may do. And they were, they became very good towards the end. Initially, they were restrictive, uh, but they always allowed us to defend ourselves under certain circumstances, which is, which is good. We had Colonel Franz for He was a uh... Four recce commander, I sure you know it. Not commander, sorry, was second in command, one recce commander. And somebody asked him in one of the comments if the Navy ever used their main guns, the 76 millimeters, to support them, or could they have done that? And he said there was only one case where that happened, where they actually were allowed to. Can you tell me about that? Because he only left us two sentences, and, and I'm curious. Okay, during an operation, uh, I'm not sure the exact details, but it was in uh, Namib Harbor, where they, because of the infrastructure there and the various parties ashore, I think it was that one, they, we knew where all the Cuban and Fafla bases were, and we knew which roads they'd take. Therefore, should something go wrong, and all the strike craft were given targets for naval gunfire support, and they had the ammunition, they were loaded, but only if the threat materialized with the open fire. That was the only predicted, ready, prepared, but in, as I say, in all cases, we were ready, we knew exactly where the target was. So it is a very controlled, controlled thing. And it wasn't, in fact, it wasn't to destroy the enemy, it was to block their route, to take out the bridge on the way or to do a gun, to stop them going through that. Way. So it's not designed at their barracks or things like that. You know, a lot of people asked, asked me about working with wreckies, you know, killers and things like that. And I used to point out, if it's the one thing I learned very quickly, it's the last thing, and don't forget, on all our operations, we were not to leave any trace. In fact, if anyone thought we could be traced, 
we had to stop the operation immediately. One of our greatest things was not to be identified. Somebody else had to be the person. And if it's the last thing that the recce would want is to leave a dead body. They, they specialized in not being seen. They specialized in doing it without being detected. So the, what people perceive as our special forces, they're the exact opposite. In fact, I can tell you the IQ requirements for being a special forces operator is a lot, lot higher than driving a bus or even transport, things like that. They were pretty high. They were in the top percentage of this country because they wanted people who would survive and not leave evidence. So it was never out to kill people, never. And the other rule was quite simple. And that is how I was able to write the book because in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they tested all our operations. Was it approved by the authority? Was the, the targets specified? And in the event of threat to civilian population. And in any case where that happened, they stopped. But that's why no one ever got prosecuted for special forces operations that I know. That's very true. That's very true. I was involved with the TRC, but on the other side. Um, mm. Long story. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't believe it. I came out of the police and I ended up in a human rights law firm and we were <laughs> assisting. It was really only in South Africa. But I must well, tell you. Yes? No, say that, that makes it fair. Yeah, no, it does. But every, every single Special Forces member I spoke to here, uh, anti private, said to me to thank the Navy. Mm. They said to them it could not have been done without them. And they are really uh, praising. As I said, the utter professionalism. I had never a fear of going back and the ships wouldn't be there. In fact, I believe in this book we wrote for SVF4E. In his book, he actually, when they blew that bridge, uh, Gerald yes. Bridge, he said the frigates, well, sorry, the strike craft came in right to the shore. He said it was one yep. of the most amazing sights besides the birth of his children. He's still in, you know, he's still talking about it. It was sunrise and there was a Russian ship in the harbor. I, in fact, my ship was one of them. I just handed over to a friend of mine. And he tells the story as well. And they were told, we've got to get out of here. Nope. We don't leave them. Yeah, Some well, of the things happened in Katna, where we went yeah. to close the beach to get the guys medical stretch immediately. So. I believe today is the anniversary of Kerslach, actually, the 30th of November. Because I got a, a text message from France for you about the death of Captain Koki. So Every year I go to the Belleville Cenotaph, I lay white lilies on his cenotaph because that's his known memorial in Belleville. Sadly, yeah. his brother died as well. The two of them are both commended on the same Belleville cenotaph. Yeah. I'm quiet for a moment for brave men. You know, I sit there often and I listen to these people and I listen to people like you as well. And I think to myself, well, what a life. You know, we, we read the history books. I love history. I, I, I like reading history. But then you talk to the people who make the history. You know, and that is, that's actually the great thing. Mm. Admiral, I wish to thank you for your time. And thank you for explaining these things to us. I think the service for Navy is a bit of an unknown to many. So I'm really glad that we went through the basics. We covered a few things. In the next videos, we will cover more of the specifics. We will talk about operations, things like that. But for now, thank you. And to all of you listening here, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up. Thank you for spreading the word. It's the only way we can do it. It's through you. And if you have a story to tell us, please just contact me and let's see if we can take it from there. Until we meet again, God bless.